Hello and welcome to the next lecture for Objective 1.5 and this one we're going to be talking about algorithms. Now algorithms can be incredibly complicated, they can include a lot of information, a lot of stuff, um, so we're really going to be looking at very simple components of algorithms in this class. So um, if you've done programming before, you'll probably be laughing at this, um, this topic. If you've never done programming and you're like, what is an algorithm? That's what this is for today. So why algorithms? So there are so many problems in geomatics that have many, many steps. So we're only getting started right now, but you're gonna see that like, as we go through our entire course outline, there's gonna be like unit conversions that we talked about. Um, then there's going to be scales. Well, now I can include um, unit conversions with scales. And then I can bring in elevation data for topographic mapping, which is the next topic. And then now I've got scales and, and elevations and I've got unit conversions. And then I can bring in different angles and then I can bring in coordinates and use those to go between different angles and different norths. And then on top of that, I can go into like geodesy stuff and I can go into like GIS layers and blah, 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 blah. So there are so many different components to a geomatics problem that we need to look at how can we break it down and how can we break it down into simple steps where we don't miss anything. So if we do miss something, we can end up with wrong answers. We can have incorrect measurements. Um, it, you can have problems later down in the road. Um, a really good example is going out and staking out a house. For example, if you skip the step of doing a check at the end, you might have put the basement in the wrong place or maybe the wrong size. And then, um, so like just the, Thinking about that, that's why we choose an algorithm. So algorithms take it and, and take our, our information or our big problem, takes what we know, what processes can be applied, and it breaks it down into very logical single point pieces. So I like to have it visualized. Um, the reason I do that is because it is easier to read, it's faster to read, and very easy to follow. When you have written out steps, that is nice for the people who can work down it, but then you're like, oh, go back to step three if this doesn't happen. And then, oh, well, but, but if this happens, then you need to go to step seven. And then it, you go to step seven and it's like, oh, but actually you need to go back to step two. So like there can be so many crazy things going on that if you visualize it, it actually makes it easier. So there are some algorithm rules. So first of all, one step at a time. So for example, if I were to say you, there's an, an algorithm of getting out of bed, let's just keep it really simple. So number one, I'm not going to say I roll over and take off the blankets. Right, let's just say that's the case. So what you are going to do is you're going to roll over and then the next step is remove the blankets. So that needs to be two steps because those are two different things that are not related directly with each other. Then we have input. So what is in the input? This is the information that we know. So, and every single input needs to have its own symbol. So that means that, um, for example, if I'm using a, doing a recipe, if I have flour and eggs, I don't keep them separate, I put them together. So, or sorry, <laughs> totally just said that backwards. Um, no, if you have flour and eggs, you keep them separate. You don't put them together. So if flour is its own thing, eggs is the other thing, because those are not two of the exact same thing. Then you are going to, um, another rule, sorry, is not linking steps that don't build on each other. So I'm going to use the recipe idea as an example, because it is the easiest thing. So for example, let's say I am making like cinnamon buns. So I put in all my stuff, I make my dough and I have to let it rise. Now, because it is rising, I am not taking the result of that step of letting it rise and putting cinnamon in it, right? So there's the cinnamon like sugar part that goes in the center of the, the, of the, the dough after it is risen, but I can't link the two. So those, that would be actually a separate stream is making that cinnamon sugar mixture. 
where the dough is its own stream. So don't ever link the two together. It's like saying that I have two different equations that eventually I'm going to put together. If I go 1 plus 2 equals 3 in 1, I'm not using that 3 to go 4 plus 5 equals 9. So I need to keep those separate. Um, then the next rule in here is output symbols. So always include what the answer is. Don't just say output or don't just say stop. Um, your output might be error in the program, or you might, it might be um, stop surveying. It might be something along those lines, but it's either the output from the equation or it is the um, output that says to stop doing something. So logical and relational operators. This is really um, more on the programming side. So I'm bringing in a little bit of programming, but it is breaking it down into little pieces. So logic is incredibly important. Um, we have relational operators and we have logic operators. And so the relational operators are things such as greater than, less than, equal to. So if you see this, the double um, equals, that means equal to. This means not equal to, so the straight line and then that. Sometimes you'll see an exclamation mark as well. And then greater than, and, or sorry, less than and equal to or greater than and equal to. Those are all relational operators. It just says, is this value bigger or less than or equal to or whatever than the other. That means that because if I say A is less than B, it gives me an answer of yes or no. And yes or no can be yes is true or zero is false. This jumps into the binary world. We're not um, going to go any further than true or false in this class. So when we use a one, it means true. If it is zero, it means false. So if it helps you to remember that one is true, you can think of one as a closed switch. So it actually connects one end to another because it, one is a line. <laughs> so it connects one to the other, so therefore it is true, and therefore everything can continue to flow. If it is false, the zero is similar to a stop sign. It just means like, no, this is not right. You've got to stop and do something different. So that's, um, that's where that comes from. So for example, one is not greater than two, so therefore the answer is zero. Or A is equal to B equals one, so that means that A is um, maybe a value of three, and B becomes a value of three. Therefore, three equals three, and that means the answer, or the truth is, is one. So that's the relational operators. Then we have logic. Now logic gets a little bit more complicated. So with logic operators, um, these help make decisions. So it is, again, still a zero or one in the end, but we'll do things such as loops or branching. And so a couple examples are and, or, xor, or not. So generally, you're going to have a relational operator on one side of the logic operator and then another relational operator on the other side. So for example, we have a greater than zero and a is less than 90. So if the answer is 100, as it gives here, it, do, it is not, or it is greater than zero, but it is not less than 90. So because I'm looking at and, that means that the answer is going to be zero. So and means that both situations are true, if it's going to be a answer of one. So um, yeah, so a greater than zero and a less than 90, if it is 75, then it is true. If I have or, or means one of them has to be true. So or if I have, um, if I said a greater than zero or a less than 90 in my example I'm giving there, then that would mean that it would actually be, and, and the answer is 100, or a is 100, I should say, then the answer is actually one. It is true because it is greater than zero, and 100 is greater than zero, but it is not less than 90. But with or, I can say that that's what it's checking for. XOR means exclusive or. So exclusive means only one of them is true. It can't be, you can't have two of them that are true. So XOR, if I said that, you know, A equals 75 in my example, XOR 
answers as false. The reason being, again, because XOR can only have one of them that is correct. So if A is greater than zero, XOR A less than 90, and it is the, and A equals 75, then both of them are true. So therefore you get an answer of zero. Not means, it's kind of the opposite of and, it just means that both answers have to be false, both relational operators have to be false for it for the not to be true. <laughs> so this is the case of two negatives make a positive. So that, that's where that comes in. It's not used a lot, but I've used it as an example in, in here. So I tabulated it out for you here. So if Z is the relational statement on the left, and K is the relational statement on the right, the table shows the result of each scenario. So if both Z and K are one, and is one, or is one, XOR is zero, because both of them are true. And then not, it also comes out as false. Then for and, if Z equals one, and K equals zero, I just realized I have an error on here, because if they're both, no, they're both false, so therefore it's false. So that's right. Okay, so Z equals one, K equals zero, this is zero. Uh, um, so that's false because not both of them are the same. Um, one, both of them are, or one of them is true, so therefore OR works. Only one of them is true for XOR, so therefore it is also true. Not is zero. Then we have Z equals zero and K equals one, so both have to be true. Or sorry, both of them are, sorry, ah. Yeah. And has to have everything that is the same. So again, it's very much the same as the previous line. We're going to see the same for those. Then if they are both false. So and is zero because they are both false. And has to have them as true, not as false. As soon as it says, you know, no, it's, it's not greater than zero and it says and, it stops looking. It won't even go to the next relational operator because it says they're not true. Neither of them are true. So therefore it is a zero. Then or zero, X or zero, because none of them are showing up true, but not, this is the one time that it does become true. So that is how those logic operators work. Now with branching, branching is often we use as if statements. So if something is true, then this happens, else this happens. So we, I usually start off with explaining if something is true, then do this. You don't ne necessarily need the else. Um, if you do have the else, that kind of tells you what to do if it is negative. So the if statement is where there is a need to make a decision. Then an else or the branches off the algorithm pathway. So a good example is uh, just verbally, let's say you head out and you go to a restaurant. If you get served in 10 minutes, then you are happy with your service. Else you are unhappy with your service, right? So will you return yes or no? So that is um, where the decision will be made. But so you, you see that there's that then and else, and it works very much so in our regular everyday life. So here's an example of an if branching. So we have a greater than zero and a less than 90. So because this statement, depending on the answer that I am get that I have for a, I have two options. Then I can keep processing if it does actually fall in there. If it does not fall in that 90 degree within 90 degrees, then the, the else statement says to stop processing um, and the other, pro the other part is giving an error. So this is starting to look like that algorithm. And um, then we can keep going here. So with nesting. So here we have the if statement, a greater than zero and a less than 90. Then that means it falls in the northeast quadrant. What if it doesn't fall in there, but it's between 90 and 180. Well, now, then it is southeast. But if it's not falling in there, then what do I do? I go to 180 and, and between 180 and 270. 
and I can keep going. So I can find out what my quadrant is without even having to think about it. If I were to write a program to do this, it makes it very easy for me to work through. So branching is relatively straightforward with the if and then. So this is the visualization of that. So you can see else if in this statement. If it was just else, we go back to this, where it just you know ends. Now, don't take these, these symbols as they are. I will be showing you an example with actual, like, real symbols in a moment here. So, um, but then here with nesting with branching, we have else if. So that means that there's else make a decision. And we can combine that into one statement. That, that works as one statement. All right, so that's nesting with branching. Then we move on to looping. So looping, there are two kinds of loops. There's a do loop and a while loop. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on looping. It's just that you, so you know what they are and that you can apply them if you need to. So a do loop has you complete a task first, then it checks a logic statement. So if you need to do something no matter what, you can use a do loop. And then, then you check it and say, okay, am I done with this or do I have to go back and redo it again? Or do I have to iterate, right? The iteration means um, do it again with the new numbers that you have. So the loop ends when the logic statement becomes true. So do this task until whatever statement is true. So um, a good example in like just real life, you know, you, you go to a restaurant and order wings. Do go to the restaurant and order wings until you are full or you run out of money. Right? So that would be one of the two, right? So that would be an or statement until I am full or I run out of money. Then, then I keep, but I keep going. So I you know, do, do I actually go back to the restaurant every time? Probably not. That's actually something that I would put outside of the do loop. So I would go to the restaurant, then I would have do order wings and eat them until I'm full. I check to see, am I full or out of money? No, I'm going to order more wings and then do the, the same thing again. So I keep going. Um, while loops, when they, they check the logic statement first before completing a task. So the loop ends when the logic statement becomes false. So this time I say, okay, well, while I am hungry, I will continue to order or I will continue to go back to the salad bar, for, for example. <laughs> I'm sure some of you guys don't eat salads, and I, I apologize. <laughs> some people may not eat chicken wings, so I'm going to use two examples here. <laughs> so, anyway, so while I am full, or while I am still hungry, or while I still have money, I will keep going back to the buffet, or keep going back to the salad bar. And I'm going to keep repeating that until I'm full or run out of money, right? So, that, that while statement is what I'm checking. So it, once this becomes false, then I stop. So that's how the looping works. So um, this is important for like theory. Uh, you don't need to be able to actually implement this um, in like a programming form or anything in this class. But here's an example. So we have input, we have a decision, then we have processing symbol, which is the rectangles, and then value. So it's a, so I want to highlight this component on this side of the right hand side of the screen. Every algorithm has three essential parts, input, processing, and output. A very simple algorithm that I often use in class, I try to get everyone to kind of think about this, but it doesn't work that way while we're online. Um, so every algorithm has three essential parts. When I go to eat breakfast, what do I do? I have to input the food. So I take the food on the plate and I put it in my mouth. Then I have to process it, right? So I have to chew it, I have to swallow it, my stomach does its thing and so does the intestine. So the processing component has several different parts. All of those components are linked, right? They go one after the other because otherwise I can't do one out, out of it. I, it can't go into my mouth or it can't, I can't chew it before my stomach processes it, right? So. Um, or sorry, I can't chew it after my stomach processes it, not before. That's that was backwards. So, uh, so with processing, it is essential. We every algorithm also needs that. 
So every algorithm, need, algorithm needs something being put in, something processed, and finally you need some output. For example, if you are using your computer, an algorithm that, they, that somebody wrote at some point way back in history was when you move your mouse, the arrow follows it. Guess what? So my input is the human input of the mouse. The processing is what the computer is doing to visualize that arrow on the screen. The output is the actual movement of the arrow on the screen. So all of those are the three essential parts. If you don't have all three in an algorithm, then you've done it wrong. So you really, really need to ensure that you have those three essential parts. So I use, these are the, the, the standard shapes that I use. I use upside down triangles for input symbols. As you can see, A and B are separate. They are not together. So don't put a whole massive list of them in there. Then I am testing here. I say if A is less than B or A is less than zero. So if this is true, if A is actually less than B, then I need to ask for new numbers. Um, or let's say this is true, A is less than B, um, then, I, then it's just gonna jump to here. Now, does this work for you, right? Because, or this is, this is sorry, this is if A is less than B, then it's negative, then it's positive, then it's gonna go over here right away. Or A is less than zero, then it's gonna go over here right away. That means that I have a loop. This is my loop, okay? This particular loop, what am I doing? I am checking first. I input values and I check it before I process. So that means that I am doing a while loop. Although this is backwards for while loop because this would be, um, or actually no, this is true. This would be a while loop because if this is true, it's gonna go back here. Then we have, the, so that's the decision. Then we have our else statement. So let's say this is A is greater than B, so that's false, or A is actually greater than zero, then it, this becomes false, so we come to else. So you can work this backwards or you can work it forwards. I, I put this as a confusing way for you just so you can see it kind of done in a reverse format, but this then created a while loop for me. But this else, I go down to a processing thing, I put in my equation, and then I'm gonna give my value of whatever that is. Okay, so even if this is a, um, a symbol, like if I said x equals a mi the square root of a minus b, then my value would be x. So to always include that in the end. So this is an algorithm example. You do have an algorithm example in your workbook um, that you can work through. So I suggest working through that. And um, we will move into objective 1.6 in the next video.